I'm very happy to be able to um, introduce um, Dr. Ikande uh, Kwayu, who is um, presenting on her book um, that she, uh, I think that that book came out um, a few months ago. It was, um, it's a 2020 public and based on her PhD research, I believe. Um, religion and uh, British international development policy, as you can see here. Um, so we will have, um, as usual in these sessions, about 20, 25 minutes of presentation um, from um, Ikande. And then we um, are also happy to welcome um, Sabine um, Dreha from University of York in Canada um, to give a response of about 10 minutes and then we'll have some final time for question and answers at the end. Um, okay, um, Ikande, we can see your presentation. Um, so whenever you're ready to go full screen to present, um, I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much, Olivia. And thank you everybody for joining this reading group to discuss my book. I'm very humbled and I'm happy to do so. Uh, so I will just very briefly uh, as an outline explain my book contribution uh, to, the, uh, to the literature on uh, religion and international politics, but in particularly faith and development and also to discuss other things, but I really look forward to the discussion after, particularly from response from Sabine, but also the question and answers and how we can further uh, develop research on faith and development and religion and politics at large. So this book was published in March, as Olivia said, by Palgrave Macmillan. It's based on my PhD um, thesis which I completed in 2012, but to publish the book, I had to uh, update the research. So I did further analysis to see what actually uh, transpired from 2012 when I finished to 2019. So I will just go straight to the um, first slide, which is just a very general background and I'm sure aware because we have interest in religion and international relations. Uh, so we, might, we, we are aware of um, the background of how religion uh, came to, uh, gained prominence in the international relation uh, discourse and studies and uh, interest. So now it's not very strange anymore to study religion or to analyze religion in international affairs. Since the end of the Cold War, there's more interest to, to do so. And uh, if you look at the literature, wide literature on religion and uh, international relations, post Cold War, but even before, um, we see that uh, there are different aspects whereby some focuses on the theological, spiritual aspects of religion and the role of that in international affairs and in political decision-making, but others, Focus, focuses on institutional or practical aspects of religion. Uh, also, some focus on the um, positive roles of religion, but others on the negative role of religion. So we, see, we know that religion is double-sided in the sense that uh, it can be a force for good, but it can also be a force for bad. So in the literature, we see uh, these differences. Uh, but for this book, uh, it's focuses on the positive side of religion, but also it focuses on the institutional or practical aspect. So I don't delve into the spiritual matters, but I look at religion as an institution and religious institutions and their work in uh, international development. And the book also focuses on faith groups in the United Kingdom. So I only focused on the, uh, the, the faith groups that are registered and those that are working in the United Kingdom. Um, and the book analyzes the interaction between the UK government. And as we'll, we'll see later, it focuses mostly on the DFID, which was an independent cabinet um, department uh, that dealt with international development. So I really looked into DFID and how it engages with faith groups in the UK. 
in formulating and also in implementing policies. And the book time frame is from 1992 to 2019. Why 1992? Uh, 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 first and foremost is because it's post Cold War era, but also uh, because the book took elections, uh, and uh, this will be clearly uh, in the in the in the next slides. Elections is um, analytical time frame for analysis. So I I put the analysis into different periods based on elections. This is because different political parties in the UK had different ways of is in which it was at what uh, hmm. hello hey Hey, I can. I'm yes, sorry, it's a, I think my internet tripped. Yes, it did. You know what? Let can me. You hear me now? Let, we can share you. We can hear you now. Let me share your presentation so you're not having to share your presentation from um, for your bandwidth. Um, and then um, I'll just get that up now. Okay, good. Keep, please keep talking and we're out. Okay, thank you. Okay. So uh, um, I, I, I was explaining the time frame. Did I leave you when, when I was there or was I, what was I talking about when I left? Yeah, just when the I got end to... of the time frame and um, yes. analysis around elections, yes. Exactly, so 2019 is because that was the time when I was finishing updating the research for the book manuscript. Um, and so the initial contribution of the books, even from the theoretical design, the book ha already had contribution with regards to faith and development literature. So most of the analysis that look, uh, that look at religion and international development or faith and international development, they, they bundle together, they look at faith groups as one thing. But in this book, I've categorized faith groups into two, into two types. So we have faith-based organization and faith communities. So I have a whole chapter, chapter four, focuses only on faith-based organization, while chapter five focuses on faith communities. And this is because of they have different nature, they work differently, and also the, the way the government interacts with them was at different capacities and for different purposes. So FBOs, uh, faith-based organization, are basically NGOs but with faith identities. So if we looked at how I defined them and how I categorized them and how I studied them, I looked at their mission statements and their vision and with, if they had a faith, a declaration of faith or an association with faith. So that would qualify as a faith-based organization. We have organizations, NGOs, that maybe were started by vicars or by a church, but they ceased to be FBOs because they don't keep the faith identity. But we have several that still keep the faith identity. For example, we have World Vision, it's very clear in its mission. We have Christian Aid, we have Islamic Relief, we have, we have ADRA, CAFOD, et cetera. Um, faith communities on the other side are councils, forums, associations, and organizations through which religious identified communities or people come together and they can, they can channel their engagement with either government or other institution or with each other. So for example, in the UK, we have Muslim Council of Britain, we have Church of England, we have Act Alliance and many other. Um, so for the book, the book had three assumptions uh, with regards to why and when uh, would government, would the government interact with the, or engage with the faith groups. So the first uh, proposition was the resurgence of religion in international politics would actually determine or intensify the relationship between the government and faith groups. For example, um, issues of 
radicalization, fundamentalism, um, terrorism, religious uh, religious related uh, or triggered triggered terrorism, etc. This uh, when there is such thing or a lot of discussion, the UK government tend or tended to. more than it would have done if there was no such um, kind of resurgence in the international politics. Also, um, the attitudes of polit politicians and political parties in power with regard to the third sector. So when you talk about third sector, it's uh, NGOs, um, non-state actors, uh, and voluntary organizations, civil society organizations. Uh, so how politicians in power and also political parties in power uh, looks at the third sector will really determine the relationship between the UK government and also the, uh, with, the, with the faith groups. The third assumption is the increasing prominence of the international government agenda in British politics. And this one I'll explain um, in, in more detail in the next slides. But so I had this proposition when I was doing my PhD, but when, when I was updating the book, Brexit came into, uh, became a factor. So, and Brexit actually became a key variable in all of the three propositions, but in particular, the second one, this one, and the third one, because it influenced, Bre Brexit influenced or manifested uh, the attitudes of politicians and political parties uh, in many, an aspect, not least uh, with regards to the third sector, but also with regards to international development, etc. And also, the increasing uh, Brexit also had an influence on the international development agenda. Um, so, some of the questions that I I asked when I was looking at the Brexit, I asked how are the attitudes of political parties and politicians on international development as well as on the role of faith groups in the UK changing as a result of Brexit. Also, would Brexit enhance the prominence of international women's agenda in the British politics or otherwise? Mm. Uh, very quick on theoretical design. So I used historical institutionalism. This uh, uh, theory um, assisted uh, the, the process tracing of investig investigating UK government international policies over, over a period of time from 1992 to 2019. And also it explored policy change over time and tried to identify the causes of policy changes and their impact on the role of faith groups in policy process. So some of the findings is, um, I found out that the UK government actually interacts with faith-based organizations in the same way it, as it does with other NGOs that deal with international development. As I said, FBOs are actually NGOs, international development NGOs. They belong to BOND. BOND is a, an umbrella organization that brings development NGOs together. Uh, so the way the government interacts with FBOs is the same, largely, significantly the same as it will interact with any other development NGO. Uh, the criteria for uh, interaction, for funding, for consultation would be the same. However, there were some instances whereby faith groups, a faith-based organization would be given um, more space, maybe if there's a sensitive issue. But when they do that, they would be combined somehow with it faith with faith communities so it becomes something like a faith a faith thing faith consultation but not uh when they represent themselves with F fbos because they work in the same criteria as any other ngo uh with regards to the faith communities most faith communities do not have international development as their primary goal so they might have different goals inclusion, um, things like big society, etc. But the government engaged with them in the matters of international development, especially from 1997 to 2010. This is because in 1997, when DFID was um, formulated, because prior to that, international development in the UK was managed under the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. So it was a unit 
within the foreign policy department. Uh, and so when they decided to promote uh, international development to have its own cabinet level department, they, there was a need to raise awareness, to create um, ownership and to, to publicity. So faith communities were deemed as partners together with media, education and, and other civil society as partners to raise awareness and uh, they did that, they were campaigning, they received funding to campaign, they were put in the, in the strategy as strategic partners. Um, however, in the period since May 2010, we saw that the government moved awareness rising for many reasons that we discussed. This was when the Conservative Party came into, the, um, into power and the way it views aid generally and historically is not very favorable. So they, 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 they put awareness rising uh, down the priority list and faith communities were not deemed as important. Although in 2012, there was a, a, a strategy, a guide, a guideline, something like a guideline to, um, to work with faith communities, but they actually mix them together, faith groups, faith communities and FBOs. Um, so, I, I, I'd, I'd spoken about the uh, promotion of international development. The, the third proposition, if you remember, was the prominence of international development in the UK agenda or in the UK politics. So from 1997, when the um, uh, DFID was established, we saw international development become a prominent agenda within British politics. And that went on even in 2010, when conservative-led coalition replaced the Labour Party, still uh, the FID, because it had performed very well and it had given UK as a country prominence in the global affairs uh, to the extent that some of the British leaders were saying, we want UK to be aid superpower, in particular, Andrew Mitchell. So aid and international development became uh, a cross-cutting, cross-party agenda. So if you look at 2010 election manifesto for all three political parties, Labour, Conservative and Liberal, Liberal Democrat, they all agreed to keep or to maintain the independence of the FID as an independent cabinet, but also to reach the UN target of 0.7% of gross national income for international aid. Towards uh, that consensus, because the Conservative Party never wanted the idea of DFID and they never wanted the idea of reaching the JNI. Uh, so in 2002, we saw there was an act that was passed, uh, passed the International Women's Act, ensuring aid is used for poverty reduction. Uh, so it gave a framework for aid that the focus of British aid should be poverty reduction. And then in 2015, and this was during the Conservative Party in power, an act was passed and there was a legislation of using 0.7% of GNI for aid and it was protected in a legal framework. Uh, but even with that consensus, there were opposing views within Conservative Party. For example, David Cameroon and other Conservative key leaders have mentioned Andrew Mitchell supported the promotion of international government policy. They supported independence of DFID, 0.7%. Uh, if you read Cameroon's uh, autobiography, he speaks so highly of DFID and the aid and what they did. But most, um, some party officials, Liam Fox, uh, Boris Johnson, that time he was an MP, they were opposing to this. They argued that most aid is given by the UK to developing country was wasted. They also argued that uh, aid should focus more on outcomes rather than simply the amount given. So they are challenging the 0.7%. Also, they, they saw that there was a declining public support for aid. And we know that issues of recession, now issues of nationalism that were manifested in the Brexit, et cetera, all of these were what was really um, declining the interest of aid in the British agenda. Uh, so continue with the impact of Brexit. Uh, what's the, the question was, what's the future of the UK and in particular its position in global affairs? 
this was the question that was being asked, asked by scholars, but by policymakers and everybody who was interested in British politics, but also um, the FID and Foreign and Commonwealth Office published a joint guidance. So we can see now how things were starting to move, relating aid, putting aid very, very closely to foreign affairs, guidance on delivering international development post-Brexit. Uh, for example, they were talking about CSOs and also NGOs with funding from the EU. And uh, in 2019, uh, this guidance was promising because it promised to fund the UK NGOs if there was no deal. So they will continue to fund even those because there are a number of FBOs that were also uh, receiving funds from EU. So the UK said we will fund them. Uh, also, uh, the other question was what about access and influence EU uh, to influence EU development agenda? Uh, if you looked at post Brexit election manifesto, there were two elections after Brexit vote in June 2017 and also December 2019. In all of those uh, elections, still both parties, Labour, which is a major party and Conservative, the party in power, promised to keep 0.7% of GNI for aid. Conservative cross government, but the Conservative Party um, started. And this one could actually be traced from 2010, but very gradually. But it, from 2015, it was more. So aid, instead of aid budget being managed by DFID only, they spread the aid budget to other departments, trade and investment, defense, etc. That was the beginning of diluting DFID power. Also, conservative challenged the definition of international development. That is the 20, 2002 Act and the also OECD rules. Uh, Boris Johnson clearly and openly said in, just in 2019 before he became a prime minister, aid should save UK commercial and political interest. And also global Britain can be achieved by merging the FID back to a, a foreign and common wealth office. These are important with regards to our thinking of faith-based, uh, faith organization, I mean, faith groups and UK government because the FID as an independent department that only focuses on poverty reduction really saw the, uh, the potential and the role of faith-based organization. But when you distribute aid uh, budgets to other departments, when you dilute the FID power, uh, faith groups become marginalized because, for example, defense might not see much impact or much uh, contribution of the faith groups. So is trade and investment because they focus on commercial interest and not so much about poverty reduction. Uh, so I was ahead. Uh, so impact on faith group, the impact of Brexit on international events will be determined more by political party in power. This is what the book argued because uh, it was 2019 when I was, I was finishing the man manuscript. So the, uh, I, the book argued that it's more about the political party in power and the politician rather than the Brexit that would determine UK international development. Less spending in DFID, uh, which is now, sadly, uh, I, I think, is much back to FCO, results to less funding and also engagement with faith groups. Uh, to conclude, uh, the, the book concluded that Labour or Conservative, either would be Labour or Conservative post-Brexit, UK will still keep the UN target of 0.7% of DNA as budget for aid. This was what the book predicted, but it's very quickly been proven wrong already because we had that the UK now spends 0.5%, which is even illegal, but they are trying also to, to see how they can change the law or they can, um, yeah, they can amend the law so that it's not, they're not restricted. Uh, and also the foreign minister, I mean, foreign secretary uh, acknowledged that they might face legal challenges, but um, they have to spend less on aid. They can't keep the 0.7%. So the book has been very quickly proved wrong for this particular uh, argument, although many other things are, are, 
uh, are still very relevant. Also, uh, the book also concluded that independence of DFID is debatable and there's informed and justified concern that DFID independence will be diluted or that it will totally merge, be merged back as a unit within a, a foreign and commonwealth office. This one has been proved right. We already know that since September, DFID has been merged with FC, uh, foreign commonwealth office, but now aid is more focused on security issues, the government and countries where UK has interest. So they are very clear on that. And now, the in I think in November, October, they, they after the merge, they put uh, international government strategy, uh, and this strategy does not have poverty reduction as a goal. So it speaks about technology, commercial interest, climate change, uh, but a humanitarian response, but there is no poverty reduction, which is uh, which means faith groups will be sidelined even further, maybe in humanitarian response. But I think because the budget, most of the budget for that will be allocated to the defense, it's again uh, something to be worried. Uh, uh, policy recommendation uh, that when the book was that faith and development is still very important. UK should not lose its rich resources because there are lots of uh, old and uh, well institutionalized faith groups, in particular faith-based organizations, but even faith communities in UK, they, are, they have good experience in engaging with the government, in doing campaigning, in, in reaching to the society, etc. So this experience and this resource uh, should be really uh, be kept and uh, the UK government should continue to engage with faith groups in development matters. Also, um, there should be systematic engagement instead of loose interaction whereby it's just ad hoc when there's a need or when they need support. Uh, we, we recommend that there should be systematic engagement that is measured uh, between the government and faith groups. Uh, uh, now, uh, can, can do so right now with, within its result-based approach by, by documenting, assessing, monitoring, and measuring the outcomes. And thank you very much. This is my presentation of the book, and I would encourage everybody to read, but I invite uh, Sabine and then after the questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Akande. Sabine, uh, I'll pass directly over to you. Yes, uh, thank you. I just just, just to show my face, but I will um, <clears throat> go back to the blank screen. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me as a respondent. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to highlight how I can the study sheds more light on the relationship between religion and world politics. My background is in international, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> my background is in international political economy and my own research has been focused on the role of the Turkish Gulen movement in world politics. And some of my comments are a reflection of this context. Uh, I'm also of German background and I have been very often told that uh, I'm ref either refreshingly direct or outright rude. So please keep that in mind. Uh, at least that's the feedback that I get from my uh, students. Um, the focus of the book is Great Britain, a country part of the Anglosphere, and I think one of the highlights for me from the book is to understand how British politics is very different from the other Anglo-Saxon countries. Uh, the US is known for its influence of the evangelicals on the Republican Party. In Canada, we have multiculturalism, secularism in the Anglo-Saxon part, and laicism in Quebec, and in Australia, we have more of a US pattern. But Britain is, from outside, a very secular country in terms of the majority population. And yet, the Jubilee Debt Campaign, which is, in my mind, the most important and successful global campaign in development policy, with a strong faith background, came from Great Britain. Um, so a more systematic study of religion within the UK context is important in itself. Um, and I'm also happy to see a focus not on terrorism, but on how religious actors shape policies and politics uh, with a specific focus on development in the book. Um, I also really, really appreciate how I kind of looks that I can this question. I mean, how to explain the lessening and the heightening of relationships between the government and faith communities and faith based organizations and her systematic of the 
discussion of the three variables that she looks at, the resurgence of religion after 1989, the attitude of parties and the role of international development in, do, in domestic, the, the attitude of parties, and thirdly, the role of international development in domestic politics. This is a set of variables that she carefully lays out throughout the book. I also appreciated her methodological reflections, her intensive research process, digging through boring policy speeches, party platforms and documents, but also doing interviews. And I want to highlight really, and, and hope we can talk about this, the, the use of historical institutionalism as a framework of analysis, which allows her, and I find that absolutely amazing, to on the one hand account for continuity, but also for change through the use of this concept of critical junctures, if I understood that correctly. So that is, to my mind, really a, a rare achievement uh, that we don't have. Continuity and change in one framework of analysis through the use of historical institutionalism. I am totally blown away by that. Um, what I find interesting from a Canadian perspective and a German perspective, um, if there is a similar differentiation here in, in uh, Canada between faith-based organizations and faith-based communities. And I really like that distinction. Um, I had not, I have not made this distinction and I'm now wondering whether this is a specific British thing. Um, actually, to me, it's amazing to see that in Great Britain, there are faith-based organizations from various religious traditions established faith-based organizations and it's not just the christian religious tradition i don't think we have that in germany uh, i think in germany it's much more still ethnic kind of thing um, i don't think we have a, a serious set of fbo's like that in canada and i'm wondering if you can talk about this a bit more this distinction between faith community faith-based organizations and and here's the question do we really have a set of plural do we have a really a plurireligious set of faith-based organization in British politics? And the question is, did Britain manage to give room to immigrant organizations on an equal footing as FBOs and not necessarily as ethnic organizations? And I think that's to me is like, whoa, um, I, I, that blew me away. Maybe it's because I'm uh, German, I don't know, but it's I thought that's uh, interesting. Now, what I'm wondering about is your understanding of the res resurgence of religion. Um, the impression I get from the introduction and skim reading through chapter one is that you are concerned with the fact that religion somehow returned to the scene after an absence during the period of what Jürgen Meyer has called secular nationalism, the period of state building from the late 19th century to the 1960s. It took a while and we have a religious resurgence. So we have a research, religious resurgence in the 70s in the United States, the Iranian revolution and a full blown resurgence from the end of the Cold War onwards, as you point out. Um, in my research, I have come to the conclusion that it, it is not religion as such that emerge, but a specific form of right wing and even extremist religion. Um, we mostly discuss this in terms of Islam, uh, but the same is true for the right wing turn of the Catholic Church in the early 80s that, for example, changed the constitution in Ireland to outlaw abortion and pushed back against liberation theology in Latin America uh, in support of military dictatorships. The emergence of extremist evangelical Christians that openly declare war on democracy right now in Germany, they are part of these anti lockdown demonstrations. Um, and who commit terrorist acts on abortion clinics in the United States and who have restriction, restricted the rights of the LGBTQ plus community worldwide and the right wing Hindutva network in India, to name just a few of these more right wing um, religious groups. And so I'm wondering, uh, it's not religion as such that has a resurgence, but a right wing form of religion. Uh, which is bent on undermining the democratic process globally. And I wonder if international relations as a discipline should not put more emphasis on this. Um, this is not a criticism of the book um, because you have clearly demarcated, and I really appreciated how clearly you have demarcated your area of inquiry. But I'm wondering um, the larger question, if we're all making a mistake when we talk about religion in itself and for itself, 
um, and a, a return about post-secularism as if the emergence of the nuns, the people who are declaring no religious affiliation does not matter. And if the religion that we see in the public sphere is in reality a specific expression of religion and not religion in general, uh, that would be my uh, contribution. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not giving a presentation on the Jubilee campaign. I believe Cecilia Lynch has explained it somewhere. Uh, and But it's my most favorite campaign in the history of campaigns and contribution to development policy. And it's coming from faith-based background. And it's um, it led to debt reduction globally. And it was a global campaign, but it came from Britain. That's my contribution. So I encourage you all to read I can this book, uh, it's, it's a brilliant contribution to the analysis of uh, religion in world politics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabine. Um, I love just hearing the kind of comparative perspectives um, between uh, the UK and Germany and Canada and uh, you know other reflections. Um, that's really interesting. And I don't know, but maybe um, Akande and Sabine, you both um, are looking at although familiar with the UK context somewhat as outsiders as well and that's kind of unusual we're so used to maybe hearing about people from the UK talking about DFID so I'm really interested in that um, perspective as well um, anyway um, Ekande I would um, give you you know a few minutes to respond to anything that Sabine said that you'd want to respond to um, but also now we are generally opening up the floor for um, questions and discussions. Um, it's such a fast moving topic because as we as um, we've already heard even in the last few months um, this is changing at the moment um, and we're you know dealing with a new era in itself so um, I think we might have a lot to discuss, but um, I can it over to you just if you want to reply to anything from Sabine's comments. Yeah, um, thank you Sabine for this very generous uh, contribution, but also for the critical uh, kind of contribution whereby we need to think further. I think there is indeed um, a need to, re to research about the right-wing religious movements and uh, the resurgence of kind of religious um, extremism, uh, even uh, from the Christian side, because I think so far, there is a lot of literature on maybe Islamic fundamentalism, but less on Christian uh, kind of fundamentalism and ex extremism. I think there is already some interest on that starting to emerge research on uh, some on Pentecostalism and the, uh, with regards to the, um, their um, campaigns against LGBT rights, etc., in Uganda and in, in, in other places. So it's really a good um, area to look into. Um, also, but in my book, I, I, I was very narrow to focus only on the, um, the faith groups uh, and development and in the context of UK. Indeed, um, as you say, Jubilee campaign were very prominent, even prominent to highlight uh, the, 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 the potential and the capacity of faith groups uh, in, in development matters. And I think this was, uh, 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 this really influenced the UK government look at faith groups. Uh, also, uh, there is uh, actually uh, a number of uh, research on uh, faith and development in UK. I've seen Emma Tomilin here. I cited her quite, I, I read her, her work and I cited her in my book. She also does that research. And uh, there are others like Jeffrey Hans uh, and many other uh, scholars looking at religion, uh, faith and development in UK on different perspectives. Um, uh, uh, one thing I wanted to comment, to comment on, uh, for example, we talked about the ethnic, if these are established faith groups, whether ethnic groups, etc. I have an example of one uh, faith-based organization, which I, I interviewed way back in 2010 or 2011. This is called Muslim Hands. So the Muslim Hands, which is in Nottingham, is a really good case to understand uh, how this uh, maybe kind of a relatively new 
faith-based organization in the UK started. Muslim Hand started as a group of, like a faith community, a group of Muslims who were sympathetic to what was happening in Bosnia, and they were collecting um, relief support uh, among uh, their fellow, uh, I mean, within their communities in UK to send to Muslims in, uh, in Bosnia. And then later on, they thought, wow, this was really effective and we can, we can start a charity. And now it's, it's, it's a good, um, it's, it's a well-established FBO, which also secures funds from, DF, used to secure funds from DFID. I haven't checked for this year, but it secured some funds from uh, DFID and it's respected. It keeps its recording very well and it, it, it's really a well-established NGO and it's part of the, its member of BOND. The, the British um, umbrella organization for NGOs. So this would, uh, this would be what I, I'll quickly comment, but I invite discussion, uh, how we can move forward in this kind of research to understand and other questions if you have about the book. Thank you. Okay, we're open for um, general discussion and questions. Um, we're a small enough group, so I just invite you to um, unmute if you if you have something to say um, or raise your hand, but please just go ahead and, uh, and unmute. Um, Olivia, thanks, thanks so much uh, for that invitation and, and thank you both for the presentation and the response. Uh, it's Alistair here. Uh, some of you may know, but until the end of September, I was the Deputy Chief Scientific Advisor to DFID. Um, and one of my last acts actually, and I'll share it with, with you guys, um, was to do a paper, what was titled Strategic Religious Engagement Development and the FCDO, which was looking forward very much uh, in the way um, that you've, you started to do here. And there's, there's much chiming in of findings, both in terms of the history and the constraints and the opportunities in the future. Um, I wanted to just acknowledge that within the context of the FCDO, where the greatest resonances currently are, and you hinted at this, would be around peace, reconciliation, uh, and possibly around freedom of religion and belief, uh, rather than some other areas. So that, that's, um, I just wanted to note that, but I had one question, which in a, in a way linked to Sabine's, I think absolutely correct um, flagging of Jubilee 2000 as a social movement with which, within which faith communities were very prominent. Um, and the comment earlier on in the analysis, which was about the declining popular or population support for aid. And I think it's quite controversial to know what the UK public really thinks uh, and now uh, I'm outside of DFID, I can speak fairly freely on this. It, it seems to be really important that the government is aware of what the community or what the population thinks. And I think it's very clear that around the year 2000, the public was very aligned to the goals of Jubilee 2000 and faith groups were quite prominent in that. Now there is this proposal, it still doesn't, it has to go through government change to cut 0.7% commitment to 0.5. There are various claims of what the population thinks, what the public thinks about that. Um, because of my connection with faith groups, I'm fairly aware of a universal hostility to that cut, and particularly residing in Scotland, all political parties are hostile to that cut and feel that the population engagement in aid through local uh, communities, uh, faith and otherwise, is very strong. So I, I just wondered to re reflect on the idea of uh, basically, uh, the commitment to aid and it's speaking on behalf of the population that there is undoubtedly a constituency that is worried, says charity begins. At, I was interviewed on the radio recently and the question was, well, charity begins at home during the period of COVID. It's natural that we should cut our commitments. Um, I'm not really sure how widespread that view is. I, I just wondered for, for both uh, Sabine and, and our main speaker, their reflections on the sense to which political discourse claims population mandates, but, but the, the basis for that or, or the uncertainties about whether that's justified or not. Thanks, Alistair. 
Um, yes, you know, we have, Emma and I are even working on a, a, a note to FC, FCDO at the moment um, about, um, they have a call out for information on religious minorities. So, and the FORB stuff, that's the latest thing we're seeing as a particular trend. Um, and of course, FORB is very influential as has over the last few years in, in the previous, now previous administration or almost previous administration here been very influential too. Um, so um, let's take one more comment or question from anyone. Um, and is there anyone that would like to? Jeremy. Sure. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Jeremy Barker. I'm uh, a PhD researcher at, at IDS as well as um, currently in Washington based at the Religious Freedom Institute and uh, yeah, really appreciated the presentation. Um, one of the, the questions I had, you mentioned kind of your focus was um, faith-based organizations in, in the UK. Um, how much were you looking at the interactions with faith-based or religious communities in the places where development projects were, were taking place and, and what the interactions were, whether directly between um, FCO, DFID, or, um, or the implementing partners and their relationships with um, local faith-based organizations and religious communities. Um, I couldn't tell from, from the presentation how much that um, the kind of place of programming um, was in the, the line of your focus or if it was primarily on the the recipient organization, be that a Islamic Relief or World Vision or others um, based based in the UK. Um, so just curious to speak about that um, and how that um, plays in and into kind of development programs and outcomes. Hey, Candy, I think you have two questions to you about, um, you know, representation of the population's views um, and, and Jeremy's questions about well, about um, representing um, faith actors in um, places outside of Britain, but in relation to DFID. So over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Alistair and Jeremy. Alistair, I really like your reflection and also the, um, the challenge on the population, um, uh, the kind of public opinion on aid uh, actually, I looked at different uh, opinion polls uh, from uh, 2010 to I think 2017 or 18, if I can remember well, and see how the um, the decline the, there was a decline interest on aid or opinion on aid from the public. So there was still uh, a big support for aid, but given the 2010 recession, the cuts uh, budgetary cuts. Of course, NHS was ring first and aid budget was ring first, but still there was a lot of resentment as to why we are giving so much money outside when we still have issues and cuts at home. Again, with the COVID, um, we, with the COVID-19, as you said, there is that kind of uh, uh, mixed feeling about aid. So I haven't looked at really uh, recent opinion polls uh, for this year, since the book came out, I mean, since I submitted the manuscript, so I wouldn't know much. But I think with the Brexit, there is uh, campaigns and rhetorics about nationalism, etc. Uh, and thank you so much for the for the other reflection. I think it adds a lot to our thinking about aid, UK aid, and also the the religion uh, aspect of it. I mean, the relations with faith groups. Uh, with regards to the, Thanks I again, noticed that's great. that there was a lot of, yeah, but I, I also noticed that there was a lot of attention on religious freedom, freedom to worship, even outside the UK. So I think UK government, and this mostly came from foreign and commonwealth office to really defend the rights of religious freedom, which was actually outside my scope of research, but it's something that was interested, especially because faith communities were actually engaged uh, in in that kind of campaign and policy formulation, um, Jeremy, your question on uh, how if I looked at faith communities and faith groups in in countries in countries that received aid, so in countries that aid was implemented, I actually did not look at that. But I know one of the 
kind of competitive advantage that faith groups, I mean, faith-based organization had was to say that they have a constituency in developing countries or they are related to faith-based uh, faith organization or faith communities which have development programs in developing countries. So this relationship always gave them an extra mind, but I didn't really focus on how uh, the UK government went uh, uh, beyond um, the borders to look at faith communities. I was focusing on those that are registered in the UK. Thank you. Thanks, we have a bit of time for a few more questions. Um, I'm, I have a question, but if no, but Sabine, yeah, um, yeah, well, actually, I have a question as well. So um, I can do, I'll ask and then I'll uh, hand over to Sabine and then we can um, maybe finish with those questions. Yeah, I'm just, I am interested to go a little bit more into the comparative piece from your opinion, um, I can do, whether you see, you know, parallels in um, other, uh, Sabine picked up on this a bit more, but just from your perspective, whether you see parallels um, or particular disjunctures, you know, lack of parallels um, in other countries that you're familiar with, perhaps, and their policies towards um, um, development and um, engaging with religious actors, etc. Um, so I'd be interested to hear a bit more from, from your perspective on that. And then Sabine, please, your question. It's more of a comment. Uh, I'm actually uh, a bit astonished to see that uh, development is taking a backseat because I would think that with Brexit and global Britain, they would need it more. So uh, I wouldn't, I think I would like to hear more about that. Yeah, um, I, I don't know, I, I, maybe I might be biased to UK because I studied it for a long time, but I think there is a lot of thinking or, or there was a lot of thinking when it comes to aid, especially after uh, BFID was established. I think UK uh, invested a lot on thinking research and on how aid should be done. And I think that can uh, partly explain how it really tried to engage faith groups. So I don't know very much about US, but I, I know US does uh, Office of Faith Institution or something of the sort in the White House, but it wasn't, it was out of personal uh, kind of personal preference in the presidential, the president's personal preference. This is what I read, I, I understood. So I think for the UK, there was a lot of um, investment in research thinking. We know that, for example, the I mean, DFID funded Birmingham University uh, research on um, faith and development. And if you look at the research and development um, database, I mean, research for development, something of the sort of database for DFID, you will see there's lots of interesting research that were actually supported or funded by DFID. And I think that is credit for them. And this is how they manage to even interact and engage these different groups that have potential at different capacity, capacities in promoting aid. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's an interesting question for us now, you know, there, have, there has been um, a decade or so um, and Emma is not on this call, but others, and, and of course, Alistair, um, you know, very involved in bringing research um, and research on religion and development to the table in ways that perhaps haven't been represented in other governments, but are now represented in different ways um, and to some extent as well. Um, and I think, it, you know, we maybe need a question of where we go next in our own religion and development space responding to um, you know, the problems that we have of, you know, constantly bringing forward relatively similar evidence, but we're not really making, um, I don't know, I don't know how much we're, we're necessarily making a difference and we need to reflect on um, um, how, you know, the evidence of religion and development is able to, to influence some of the um, um, policies um, in, in helpful ways. 
um, that really responds to the realities um, that we see from the research. But anyway, this is that's that's my <laughs> positionality, I guess, in this all. Um, so um, uh, we are basically at the end of our time. Um, we, um, of course, you you should have about three chapters, in fact, from uh, Mike Candy's book um, in your emails. Um, if you don't have those, feel free to get in touch. Um, and also, we of course encourage you to to look into her book um, even further. Thank you very much, Ikande and Sabine, for um, your presentations today. We very much appreciate your time, um, and we will be um, putting the recording of this presentation up online as well for anyone that um, wasn't able to make it today. Uh, thank you to the participants for joining in as well, um, and we hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank, Thank you, Akandi.